le rôle religieux est énorme. Le, les, les dieux se déplacent sur des barques. Le, le, le soleil se déplace euh, dans la journée, il, il se déplace sur une barque, il se diurne, il se déplace le soir sur un île souterrain, sur une, sur une barque d une, d une, de la nuit, etc. Donc, évidemment, l'image même d'une île a, a, a généré, on va dire, énorme, énormément de choses, y compris, par exemple, les, les, même les cosmogonies, la, la création du monde. Ils avaient, sous, sous les yeux, ils avaient chaque année... Euh, cette immense euh, étendue d'eau qui recouvrait tout et qui, qui, a, qui a donné cette, cette très belle image de l'océan primordial. The mighty Nile, a wonder of nature, swept across Egypt's scorched earth. The flood was not a scourge, but a godsend. It spread its blessings all along the river. Modern Egypt has inherited this natural treasure. It too is sustained by the Nile. 6,000 years ago, the banks of the Nile saw the birth of early agriculture. As new techniques developed, so did Egyptian civilization. Production increased. Egyptian farmers grew barley, wheat and flax. They produced the wine and beer they loved. They were goat herds and cow herds. 3,000 years before Christ, Upper and Lower Egypt were united. From then on, all the peasants shared the same culture. There were not yet any large cities, but the emergence of ceramics and pottery and of large ceremonial centers reflects the influence of a centralized government. Thousands of villages appeared in the valley. At the same time, the spoken word was recorded in inscriptions invoking the gods. Writing, born out of worship, was spread by commerce along the Nile, the natural route for travelers and traders. Four thousand five hundred years ago, the first royal tombs appeared on the edge of the desert. They were mastabas, simple burial chambers beneath flat-roofed rectangular buildings of mud brick. In them, the kings lay isolated in the silence of the dunes, surrounded by their wealth. But these displays of opulence reveal the anxieties of the ancient Egyptians. A whole people had begun a quest for immortality. 4,600 years ago, Pharaoh was deemed the son of Ra, the sun god. He could be proud of his divine descent. His power was immense. He reigned over two million people. His last resting place soared toward the heavens. It consorted with the sun. It was a symbol of perfection. This was the golden age of ancient Egypt. Today, it's hard to imagine the wonder of the scholars who accompanied Napoleon to Egypt in 1798. That campaign led to the Western world's rediscovery of these extraordinary monuments. Around the campfire at night, the questions would have been endless. Who built these gigantic pyramids? What were they used for? And above all, what was inside them? If they were to unlock the secrets of this vanished civilization, all these questions would have to be answered. Small parties of surveyors, architects and mathematicians wearing high boots and woolen uniforms with gold buttons ventured deep into the suffocating heat of the largest pyramid. With only candles to light their way, it took them hours to work their way through the immense labyrinth. 
but they came up with the first answers to the puzzles of the pyramids. According to Napoleon's engineers, the largest of the three pyramids was 230 meters long. It was 147 meters high, the equivalent of a 40-story building. Construction of the mausoleum had required great technical precision. The angles at the base were exactly 90 degrees, and the four sides were exactly aligned with the four points of the compass. To build it, the ancient Egyptians must have been not only architects and engineers, they must also have been excellent astronomers. The pyramid was built with three million blocks of stone, each weighing over two and a half tons, and it stood on a base of carved granite. Two chambers, one above the other, lay in its center. Legend had it that the larger was the king's. After following narrow passageways for 40 meters, the surveyors climbed to the larger chamber via a 54-meter staircase, one seemingly made for giants. Here, the carved blocks fitted perfectly without the slightest gap. At the end of this passageway lay the king's chamber. Inside was the granite sarcophagus where his body was once laid. But all other traces of the past had vanished. Nothing remained of the ancient splendor. The pyramid, bare of all ornamentation, had nothing to offer seekers after treasure. Yet there can be no doubt that the rooms in which the pharaoh was laid to rest must have been magnificent. For a long time, no one suspected that just over the heads of the visitors to the royal tomb, there were discharge chambers supporting the weight of the tons of stone. The logistics involved in the construction of this room are staggering. It used nine meter slabs, each weighing several tons. Amid the graffiti left by the earliest modern visitors, an inscription in red catches the eye. Here, in the very heart of the pyramid, workmen inscribed in red ink the name of their master, the man who had the pyramid built, Cheops, one of the last rulers of the Third Dynasty. Were the pyramids the pharaoh's houses of eternity? Did they represent the stairs the dead king had to climb to reach Ra, the sun god? How do we explain the construction of the pyramids 4,600 years ago? Who were the people who accomplished this amazing feat? Cette image de la pyramide comme comme peut-être la la perfection de ce qui a été euh, peut-être justement l'âge d'or de, de, de la civilisation égyptienne, euh, 